All right, I see a power light on. Is it all hooked up, ready to go? Yeah, it should be. I was just checking the brushes. Uh, we should be able to move the blades now like this. Hey everyone, Riley here with Dark Arrow. As you can see, we have the spinner installed on the propeller hub. There were a bunch of little steps we went through since the last propeller video to get the spinner to this point. I'm gonna show you some of that work and then I'm gonna talk through some of the unique features of the spinner design that I think you'll find interesting. Then we'll hook up the battery and move the propeller blades. Let's get into it. First, I wanna show you the on-shape CAD model of the spinner and propeller hub assembly. The nice thing here is that I can make parts see-through so that you can get an idea of what's going on inside the spinner. If you watched our other video on the propeller, you'll remember I mentioned we needed to make a forward bulkhead for the spinner. We also needed to cut some holes in the spinner so that the propeller blades had somewhere to stick out. One other step we had to do was make a new aft bulkhead since our original part was set up for a different bolt hole pattern. To make the forward bulkhead, we first had to make a mold. We machined the mold from MDF on our CNC router. Normally, we use a much more involved process to make our molds, but we thought we might need to iterate on the forward bulkhead design, so we did a quick and dirty MDF mold first. Once we had the mold machined out and coated with mold release, we laid cloth in the mold, and then we vacuum bagged it and infused it with epoxy resin. We cured the part and then trimmed it to final dimensions. We also made a new aft bulkhead using a similar process. The big difference with the aft bulkhead was that we already had a nice production grade mold, so this part was more representative of our standard process for making carbon fiber parts. We used the CNC router to cut the new hole pattern to make sure it was laid out properly. After we made the new bulkheads, we cut the openings in the spinner for the blades to stick through. The hole size and position was first determined in the CAD model by actuating the blades in the model and then checking the clearance between the blades and the spinner. Then we transferred this hole pattern to the actual spinner to cut the openings. We used an oscillating cutter to do all the carbon fiber trimming work. We get asked a lot about what tools we use to cut carbon fiber, so I've put some links to the tools we use in the description of this video. After we had the spinner trimmed up, we did a rough fit up of everything and checked the blade clearance with the holes. There weren't too many surprises here, but we did decide to enlarge the openings just a bit beyond what we had in the CAD. Just in case there was some flex in the assembly, we didn't want the blades rubbing on the spinner and causing damage to the blades. The last thing we did was install fasteners in the spinner. We used bonded click bond nut plates and countersunk screws to hold everything together. The click bonds are easy to install and we use them a lot throughout the aircraft. After we had all the fasteners complete, we were ready to assemble everything together. So here it is. Now let's talk about what makes this spinner so special. The first thing you probably notice about it is that it's pretty big compared to the size of the propeller. The largest spinner that Airmaster sells with this propeller looks like this. And here's our spinner for comparison. The larger spinner size was chosen for aerodynamic reasons. When we went to a bigger spinner, it allowed us to make a more streamlined shape for the nose and cowling of the aircraft. Ideally, the nose of your aircraft would be kind of torpedo or teardrop shape for aerodynamics. But when you attach a propeller and an engine on the front of the aircraft, it forces you to deviate from that ideal shape. The most popular light aircraft engines are typically air-cooled and they have a horizontally opposed piston configuration. These engines are pretty wide and the cowlings that are used to enclose them are also typically pretty wide and they end up being kind of square shaped in the front, especially if you're using a small diameter spinner. Luckily, the UL Power engine that we chose for our aircraft is about four inches narrower than a comparable aircraft engine of the same horsepower. So that helped us out a little bit, getting back closer to that ideal shape. Another thing that we did to help ourselves out was we put the propeller way out on a long propeller shaft extension. We ended up using the longest prop shaft extension available with the UL Power engine. The last thing that we did was we built the cowling around a large diameter spinner. Using a larger diameter spinner allowed us to make a smoother geometry transition from the spinner to the cowling, and we got a much more sloped shape on the cowling, which helps to reduce aerodynamic drag. There is another advantage to going with a little bit larger diameter spinner. If you look at the cross-sectional shape of the propeller blades, it looks like an airfoil along most of the length of the propeller blade, but then it transitions to a circular cross-section at the root of the propeller blade. Now this circular portion of the blade doesn't do anything for generating thrust from the propeller. It's actually kind of just churning through the air as the propeller spins. So our larger diameter spinner covers up that circular portion of the blade and deflects air around it, 
rather than having that portion churn through the air. Now, I don't have a good measurement of how much this is worth in terms of a speed increase or an efficiency gain, but as the air race guys say, I think it's worth at least a couple micronauts. Okay, what's the catch? What are the trade-offs of going down the path of using a larger diameter spinner? Well, you could run into potential imbalance or unbalance issues with a large spinner. Your spinner and propeller need to be dynamically balanced. Basically, the mass of this rotating assembly needs to be evenly distributed around its rotational axis. Otherwise, you could run into vibration. And vibration is bad for the aircraft, and it's also uncomfortable for you as the pilot since you'd be flying in a vibrating airplane. The balance when you're using a small spinner is primarily dominated by what's going on with the propeller since that's where most of your mass is at and where most of your rotational inertia is at. But when you're using a larger spinner, the balance of the spinner itself starts to come into play more. There are equations you can use to calculate the maximum permissible amount of imbalance in your rotating assembly based off of the mass of your assembly, the rotational speed, and the desired level of vibration. And we were able to determine that for a spinner this big relative to the propeller, we had to start paying attention to the balance more. When you're trying to balance a small spinner with a propeller, uh, it's pretty easy to do because most of your mass is all rotating in the plane of the propeller disc. So that's where you perform your balancing. But we have an issue with our spinner being this long, you could have uh, potential imbalance forces along multiple different planes of the spinner. So for example, you could have an imbalance force at the base of the spinner pushing it this direction. And then further out on the spinner, you could have an imbalance force pushing it this direction, which would cause it to tip. And that's why we have this forward spinner bulkhead located here uh, that stabilizes the front end of the spinner and keeps it from tipping. But you would still have that imbalance force that you'd want to balance out. And that's difficult to do when you have multiple planes like that. So we wanted to try to minimize any inherent imbalance in the spinner itself. And that meant that we couldn't manufacture this using conventional means. We had to go to a different process. Normally composite spinners are made by laying pieces of cloth into a mold and then overlapping the edges with lap joints. What you'll typically see is seams running along the axis of the part like this. Technically each overlap is a heavy spot in the part. So you want to stagger these overlaps so they sit on opposite sides of the spinner and keep everything balanced and symmetric about the rotational axis of the part. Inevitably, there's a little bit of human error in the process of cutting and placing these pieces of cloth in the mold. So you would have a little bit of inherent imbalance in a spinner made with this process. This isn't necessarily an issue with smaller spinners, but it could have become a problem with a spinner as large as ours. So our solution was to make the spinner in two pieces and eliminate those axial seams. So the forward portion of the spinner here is made by laying multiple layers of 12 weave cloth in this dome shape. They're all continuous pieces, so there's no seams on the forward portion. And then the aft portion of the spinner is made with multiple layers of a continuous woven carbon fiber sleeve that's shaped like a cylinder and can be distorted in this conical shape. So that eliminated the seams in the aft portion. So this process, we're able to end up with a part with more even mass distribution and less inherent imbalance compared to if we had done it with multiple segments with overlaps. I also think it looks pretty cool too. So you've seen the process we went through to make the spinner. You also know a little bit more now about the design of the spinner itself. Let's get to the part everyone's been waiting for, which is moving these blades. I have the prop controller hooked up to the battery for the aircraft. So we should be able to move the blades. They're in their fine pitch setting right now, which is where they'd be for engine start and takeoff. Let's pretend we're gonna accelerate down the runway and pick up some airspeed and cruise in the airplane. So the blades will increase their angle to maintain engine RPM like this. And they'll continue to increase in angle until they reach their course travel limit, which is right here. Now they will go beyond this by engaging the feather mode like this. The feather mode is really only used in the unlikely event that you have an engine failure and you're trying to maximize your glide distance so that you can reach a runway or a safe landing location. So feathering the blades turns the blades into the oncoming airflow, which minimizes the drag generated by the propeller if it's not spinning. Let's take the blades back down 
to the position they'd be for uh, a landing or an approach. So, as you come in to land and the aircraft decelerates, the blades are going to decrease in pitch to maintain engine RPM. On your final approach, the propeller pitch is going to be really similar to what it's like for your takeoff. That's because in case you want to do a go around or a missed approach, you want to have uh, your full takeoff thrust available. So your final approach and your takeoff pitch are going to look really similar. You can see that as we ran the blades from the fine travel limit all the way to feather, we had good clearance in between the blade and the spinner itself. We're pretty much wrapped up with the propeller and spinner work. This was one of the last big systems we had to complete on the whole firewall forward installation. There are a couple odds and ends we need to wrap up with the engine, and to do that we're going to be bolting the engine back up onto the firewall of the aircraft. We're going to have some more videos coming up showing that work, so stay tuned for that, and we're going to be progressing into our first engine start, which should be pretty exciting. So thanks for watching, guys. We'll catch you in the next video.